Good evening and thank you for joining us. On tonight's show, we are fortunate enough to welcome Lewis White to provide us with some insight into the complexities of the crisis in Aleppo. Lewis, welcome. Good evening, Sarah, and thank you for having me. The main premise surrounding tonight's discussion is in regards to the perceived obligation of the international community to act in instances of mass atrocities. So with this in mind, my question to you, Lewis, is did the international community meet its obligation with respect to Aleppo? Well, Sarah, in the short time frame that we have, um, I'd like to focus on two main points, which I fear will tie in very nicely together. So I'll start off by addressing the idea that there is this obligation to act in instances such as Aleppo. This concept comes from the Doctrine of Responsibility to Protect, or R2P, which was endorsed by the UN in 2005. R2P was a response by the international community following the genocides of the 1990s, such as the Rwandan genocide, which claimed 800,000 lives, and the Bosnian genocide. It was fleshed out to prevent instances such as these from ever occurring again. Basically, R2P mandates that each state has a responsibility to protect their own population from mass atrocities such as genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And in failing to do this, the international community has an obligation, it's not just a right, but an obligation to protect other populations where the host state has failed in its duties. But for obvious reasons, R2P has been met with some quite serious criticism because it raises serious questions about potential breaches of national sovereignty. Well, Lewis, this therefore begs the question, if a doctrine such as R2P exists, then why is it that a situation such as Aleppo has arisen? As Aleppo seems to be the exact type of situation that R2P was brought in to prevent. Yes, and that is exactly the point that I'm getting at. Undoubtedly, R2P exists to alleviate situations such as Aleppo, but the reason it hasn't been implemented is R2P itself. So effectively, you're saying that R2P is its own worst enemy? More or less, yes. Bear with me on this. In 2011 in Libya, R2P was implemented militarily for the first time, when NATO undertook military action to prevent a Gaddafi assault on Benghazi. This action was unanimously backed by the UN Security Council. Had NATO stopped short at civilian protection, which is what they did by preventing the assault on Benghazi, Libya would have undoubtedly been seen as a success. However, there has been great criticism because they overstepped the mark and went as far as full-scale regime change, which clearly raised many questions and accusations alluding to a serious breach of national sovereignty. This NATO exercise gave Russia the impetus to refuse to allow intervention in Syria because there is now this fear that it could create a precedent and create a sequence of events where the West can go into a country and implement regime change under the pretense of R2P. The whole premise of this idea that there is a responsibility stems from R2P, but if Libya is viewed as NATO using R2P as a means to an end, i.e. overthrowing the Gaddafi regime, then it completely disregards the idea that action was undertaken because of a responsibility. Therefore, how could the international community have failed in its obligation if the very existence of an obligation is contentious. Lewis, you also mentioned a second point that you wanted to discuss. Yes, I feel this point is critical to discuss as it will help to further explain what I've already discussed. I'll just quickly add one, one last point regarding R2P, which directly leads into my next discussion. Another problem with R2P, and perhaps its largest inhibiting factor, is that it is held captive to the international objectives and interests of states. Take, for example, Russia, Russia's actions in Syria and the Kremlin's support of the Assad regime. This directly leads into my next point and the idea of a quote-unquote from the question, international community. So what do we think of when we say community? We think of unity in some form, no matter how tenuous. We think of unity uh, as in a group of people unified for maybe ethnic, religious or social reasons. The question I want to think about is this, and sorry to deconstruct your question, but it gives grounding to the points I've been making. What is the unifying feature of this international community? The irony of this idea that this great international community exists 
is that the only sense in which they, the states, are a community is the community of discord. The only unifying thing is that there is no unity. And this is so clearly displayed in the crisis in Syria. Syria highlights that there is no true international community. As David Miliband commented, there needs to be a political effort of far greater consequence than has currently been shown. The sheer scale and tragedy of the loss of life is inexcusable. What Aleppo shows us is that the international community has never been more divided. And this, in a paradoxical way, shows how unified they are in their unwillingness to be unified or act as a community. So in short, yes, the international community has failed in regards to Aleppo, but it is evidently far more complex than that summarization gives. Lewis White, thank you very much for joining us.